So we are going through Aeschylus's Orestia. Um, it is a trilogy of plays, but they're fairly short. And, and I think, you know, some people even describe them as, as acts. Um, these are, you know, separate plays, but yeah, I think, I think you can very much look at it as sort of like a three act play, uh, which basically collectively makes up this trilogy. Uh, so Escal, you know, to give a little background on a very kind of uh, enigmatic figure, a figure we don't really know all, all that about, you know, Aeschylus is believed to have been, been uh, born around 525 BCE, that's before the common era, uh, died around 456 BCE. Uh, he's considered the earliest of the three great Attic or Athenian uh, trage trage <laughs> tragedians, excuse me, uh, along with uh, Sophocles and Euripides. Uh, I think Sophocles is probably the most well-known, Oedipus Rex, uh, Antigone, uh, probably maybe we can thank Sigmund Freud for that a little bit, you know, the Oedipal complex and things like that. But Aeschylus is definitely, you know, the, the, the most, um, you know, the one who sort of set, set, set the standard in many ways that, that these other uh, tragedy writers, tra tra tragedians <laughs> followed along in, in his wake. Anyway, the Oresti was first um, performed in 458 BCE, again, at Athens Dionysia Festival, which was this large, you know, annual festival that they would have. Um, generally considered the most important um, annual, you know, civic festival for the city. Um, he fought in at least one or possibly both of the Persian Wars um, in 490 and then in 480 to 479 BCE. Uh, interestingly enough, his grave only records his military exploits as if that's the only thing that matters. His, his great, you know, artistic uh, accomplishments apparently was not as important as him, you know, serving as a soldier, specifically at the Battle, at, at the battle of um, Marathon, which of course is a very famous battle in history. Um, out of about 70 plays that he is believed to have written, only seven survived, including, you know, the three that we now have or have gone over. Um, the Arrestia was originally made up of four plays. Uh, Proteus, the fourth play, is now lost, except for maybe one line of dialogue. Now, um, it's not as essential to the rest of the play. Uh, Proteus was considered a satyr play. Um, satyrs in Greek mythology are these, you know, these sort of like little men with, you know, goat, goat legs and hooves and things like that. Um, a satyr play is, is, is kind of like comic relief. And it would have been, you know, performed after... Um, the Orestia after the trilogy uh, to kind of, you know, relieve, relieve some tension, sort of send people home on a happy note. I guess you could argue that the Orestia has kind of a happy ending, um, but it's obviously very, you know, tragic plays, a lot of weight to it and drama. Uh, so a sadder play like this was basically, you know, again, to really, you know, to relieve some tension, give people a little bit of comic relief, send, send them home on a happy note, basically. Um, now the characters and, and the, mythology of, of the play generally follow, you know, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which of course deal with the Trojan War, uh, which forms, you know, obviously a very important backdrop to the, to the play. Uh, the Odyssey, of course, follows Odysseus on, on, on his journey home. Um, now, it's, you know, it's interesting that, you know, to consider in modern day terms, for, for, for example, you know, where people are so proprietary over their, their intellectual property rights and things like that, that these are not, you know, considered to be Aeschylus's own characters, right? They, these were sort of like the common property, the common intellectual property, if you will, of the Greeks, of the Athenians. And, you know, essentially most of the, you know, major artists of this era, playwrights and things like that, would sort of, you know, poets would, 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 would you know, sort of sample from, 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 from these different characters and sort of, you know, use them in, in their own way. They, they were not considered the, you know, again, the exclu exclusive property of Aeschylus or anything like that. And there, of course, there are other renditions and versions of, of, of this story as, as, as well involve, involving these characters. Um, anyway, for the Athenians of this era, the, the Trojan War, which is a, you know, people believe that it, it may have been, now may have been based on a real conflict and that there may have even been a historical city of Troy. For many years, it was considered 
mythological, that this was, you know, just something that it, it invented in myth. Now people tend to make the argument that, well, may, there may have been a kind of historical historical basis for this. Um, but the Trojan War, which was fought, you know, centuries ago, prior, you know, uh, centuries before um, Aeschylus's era, um, obviously looms very large within Greek, Greek culture, uh, but it's generally considered to be reflective in many ways of more contemporary political conflicts involving the Greeks and so-called barbarians, especially the Persians. Now, the word barbarian, which obviously has a certain kind of um, connotation to it, um, for the Greeks basically just meant anyone who was not Greek. <laughs> basically, any, any, any kind of foreigner was a barbarian to them. Uh, but again, like I said, you know, the Persian Wars were, were fairly recent uh, during this, you know, at, at, the, at this period of time. Uh, so this is a artistic rendering, supposedly of Aeschylus's death, which I don't know if anyone read that or not, but apparently um, he died when a eagle uh, dropped a tortoise on his head and brained him with it, killing him. What a way to go, right? Was this something archived or articled, or is this just like something that was said after his death? <laughs> I think it's just something that was said. I don't know if there's any you know, empirical evidence to show that that's in fact the way he died. It seems fairly improbable, but um, I tend not to believe that that's probably how he actually died, but that, that, that at least is the story, how he died. Uh, and he was in um, Sicily at, at the time as well. People often over, overlook the fact that the um, Sicily, the island of Sicily, as well as the lower Italian peninsula, or maybe even the entire Italian peninsula, what, what was very much, you know, integrated within the Greek world as well. There's the famous or infamous Sicilian expedition in the Peloponnesian War, which, 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 which would happen after this, for example, uh, as well. Um, so again, a little bit of a background now on the city of Athens. So Athens, which was a city-state, right, there was no sort of unified Greek nation at this time, that it was a city-state, meaning it was more or less a autonomous self 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 governing city uh was doing very well after after the persian wars um they of course came out on the victorious end of it uh essentially led led the fight against the persians along with you know a, a lot of the other greek city states in the area um athens you know people often refer to the athenian empire during this period of time uh you, you know you, you you could say that but it's, it's certainly i would say more of a kind of regional empire it, it did not you know for example conquer all of europe or or asia or anything like that it was more or less you know concentrated in the coastal areas that it occupied you know within the or, or, or around the aegean sea uh, but it certainly was yeah the dominant power within that area and its power rested upon its naval power as well. Uh, so at several places, um, Agamemnon is referred to as the king of ships, which is interesting because it's generally believed that his power, you know, as a military leader would have stemmed from his command over a large army, not necessarily over, you know, fleet, fleets of ships. So it's it's been argued that that's kind of a projection, you know, sort of projecting onto Agamemnon, the sort of, you know, Athenian prosperity and power dur during, during this period of time. Now, after the Second Persian War, something known as the Delian League is founded in 478, uh, which is basically an association of city-states, again, of the other Greek city-states, to fend off Persian invasions and other potential invasions as, as well. Uh, some actually, like, like the economist Michael Hudson, uh, have compared it to NATO, which I think is an interesting comparison, obviously something very topical, uh, which is what, what is going on now. Uh, you know, before class, I, I was reading that the U.S. and Germany are now sending tanks to the Ukraine and a further escalation of the war with uh, Russia. The, 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 the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have now pa uh, placed their doomsday clock 90 seconds before midnight, which is the closest that it's ever Came came to even more so during the Cuban missile crisis. This is this is sort of their you know the doomsday clock, which has been around I think since like 1947, is is basically their um, I don't know their projection of the potential for you know annihilation basically you know global catastrophic um, 
um, you know, something of, 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 of glo global catastrophic consequence, particularly a nuclear war, but also things like global warming and climate change. So, you know, like I said, this, you know, uh, this is very much a, a topical thing. Um, now, NATO is, 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 is basically, you know, an association of European states with the United States, uh, which is basically formed in the early days of the Cold War, basically to fend off uh, potential Soviet invasions, which, depending on what you read, may or may not have been a likelihood uh, after World War II. Um, NATO still exists, you know, today, long after the Cold War has ended. Um, and again, you know, uh, I, I mean, I mean, if, if you understand a little bit about what NATO is like, it might help you to understand what this Delian League was like. The U.S. kind of plays the role of Athens, obviously. It, it's sort of like the preeminent power, uh, but it's also sort of part of a larger sort of alliance of other um, powers, other states who all sort of, you know, contribute to to the maintenance of this organization. Um, now, the Athenians eventually started using, you know, the funds, so all the members basically, you know, could contribute funds for, for, for the upkeep of it. Uh, the Athenians eventually started, you know, using these funds for their own purposes, you know, to, you know fund, fund their own government and military and things like that, which kind of pissed off other states, most particularly Sparta, uh, which eventually led to the, Pel to the Pel Peloponnesian War uh, between Athens and Sparta. Um, and, and was sort of using this league, again, to ha have, have its allies basically pay the, the bulk of Athens' military expenditures, uh, which, again, you know, critics would say is sort of what the U.S. does with NATO. Um, people who defend NATO in the United States often point out that, you know what, the, the U.S. doesn't actually really spend all that much money maintaining NATO, just, you know, just a few hundred million dollars. That's like, you know, chump change for the United States government. Um, as if that is a good defense, you know, what it does reveal, of course, is that, yeah, I mean, that's basically is, is what is going on, is that, you know, the U.S. basically has these other countries essentially pay for its own military expenditures, at least within that region of the world. Now, of course, when you look at the overall U.S. military budget, it's, you know, ast astronomically high, right? I mean, almost a trillion dollars a year funding the, you know, network of bases it maintains throughout the entire world. But anyway, uh, it, it's it's an interesting you know comparison to make. That's all. Um, Athens did also, again, much like the U.S., get get other states to use its own currency, the the Athenian silver owl coin. The owl, of course, being a symbol of wisdom, uh, just like the U.S. has 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 you know uh, gotten other countries to use the U.S. dollar basically as the global uh, reserve currency. Most countries keep sort of stores of of dollars or dollar denominated you know assets um on their on their on their on their balance books on their on their on their budgets i mean um, anyway conflict between you know athens and sparta eventually led to, to the peloponnesian war although that's not really you know our our concern here um now i mentioned that the play was first performed in 458 uh between 462 and 461 um Ephialtes and pericles two of the leaders of Athens, Pericles, you know, became a very important, um, well-known Athenian leader. Uh, after uh, stripped the 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 aristocratic court of the Areopagus, uh, which is the site of the trial, of course, in 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 the Furies in the third play or the Eumenides, um, stripped it of its powers, which was this, like I said, this very aristocratic court, this very elitist court, um, and basically transferred a lot of its powers to the local courts to the democratic you know council um which is generally seen as a move to sort of you know enhance the democratic you know um rule within the city um although it did not you know again abolish the court um overall you know it, it did maintain it um which some people say is you know re reflective of athena uh sort of you know taking power away from the furies but also you know preserving the furies within a religious cult. Uh, here's basically a map of uh, the Aegean region. You can see Athens here. Now, this is for, from w w when you had the later conflict between Athens and Sparta. So you see the, sort of the division of, of, of the region into the, the, the Athenian and Spartan allied areas, as it says, with a lot of neutral areas um, as, as well. <clears throat> now, again, you can see 
you know, Athens is very close to Turkey, which is Asia. Um, it's not on the map here, but, you know, not far off from Egypt as well. Um, even though, you know, Athens is often, you know, considered to be the, the origins of, of what we today refer to as Western culture, um, I think it's very much, you know, a debatable point to what extent was Athenian culture the sort of, you know, homogenized, you know, again, Western culture that was completely divorced or separate from the other cultural influences in the area, from Egypt, from Asia, et cetera. Um, obviously, you know, the proximity to, you know, the water meant that there was a lot of trade and commerce going on between these different areas. Um, so it's, it's, it's not all that hard, hard, hard to believe that they would have been, you know, exposed to different cultures, obviously, and, and, and of course, the different ideas as well. Uh, some have argued, <clears throat> for example, that, you know, Plato may have been influenced by Hindu philosophy, for example, which is an interesting idea, and possibly even, you know, influences even further back, if, 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 you, if you account for the, you know, the Silk Road uh, leading from, from China, the, these, you know, trade routes, which would have sort of reached their terminus here. Um, it's, it's, you know, not at all um, a settled matter as, 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 as to what extent, you know, the, these, these cultures can be sort of com compart compartmentalized into these sort of, like I said, kind of homogenized uh, sort of separate, separate cultural boxes. Um, I think it's, it's much more likely, of course, to, to think that there was kind of a very much a sort of, you know, inter, inter, in, intermeshing and mixing of different, uh, you know, cultures that that occurred here. Um, this, uh, you know, this period of time is also referred to as the Axial Age after a book by Carl Jaspers. Um, and what's interesting about that is that, you know, these very important foundational figures within different cultures, I'm talking about Socrates in Greece, I'm talking about Zoroaster, in Persia, um, Buddha, Confucius, and maybe even a few more, you know, all kind of lived around the same period of time. I mean, it is kind of interesting, not, not the exact same period of time. I mean, there's not a direct overlap, but within about 50 to 100 years of each other, uh, all these figures kind of emerged. It is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, is it a coincidence? You know, I mean, that all the, you know, the who, who of course, all, you know, the people I mentioned have this, you know, you know, Im important foundational influence of the cultures and civilizations that they belong to, that they literally form, you know, kind of like the cultural bedrock of their respective civilizations. What accounts for that? I mean, why do they all, you know, show up at, at, at around the same, you know, around the same period of time? I would argue that, you know, again, it, it shows the kind of the spread of ideas that, 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 that was going on during that period of time. But anyway, that's, that's another uh, topic. I suppose. Anyway, though, so you can see Athens, you can see some of the, you know, some of the geography of the area, you can see where Troy is believed to have been, you can see M Mount Ida, which is referenced in the play, for example, uh, you can see Crete, which I'll have some interesting things to say about later on in class, uh, you see Sparta, you see Mycena, now Argos, which is where the play actually takes place, is not pictured here, but it would have been very close to Mycena, and some people have pointed, and, and some have pointed out that, that Interesting enough, Aeschylus kind of switches locations. Uh, Agamemnon is supposed to be the king of Mycena, but he actually switches it to be the king of Argos. I'm not clear exactly as the reasons for that, but they are certainly close to each other. So maybe that that probably played some some kind of role at least. And then of course you see other areas, Corinth and Thebes, which is where you know Oedipus takes place. Mount Olympus, which is actually pretty far away, Macedonia, where Alexander the Great would eventually emerge from, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, now, let me say a little bit about the cultural life in, in Athens. So theater, of course, played a very large role in the cultural and civic life of the city. Uh, the so-called city Dionysia was the most important, uh, like I said, annual civic festival. Uh, it's 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 called that because there was a rural festival as well, the rural Di Dionysia, which was celebrated in the country, obviously. But the city was again a a, a urban affair, you know, something which which occurred, uh, you know, that that unfolded basically within the city of Athens. Um, there's debate of you know when exactly it, it was held. It's generally believed to be in March, given the you know ease and travel, you know, the seasonal uh, constraints 
that there would have been back then. Uh, it lasted for about five days, so a pretty long festival. Uh, later on, you know, again, as Athens rose in prominence and power, it would sort of sort of serve as like a, sh a showcase basically for people to kind of show off the wealth of Athens and, and, and you know, all the neat, neat little, you know, trinkets and treasures that they were able to uh, extract basically out, out of their allies. Again, going back to the Delian League and, and, and things like that and all the nice little gifts and souvenirs that they were able to accumulate. Um, the original play is believed to have been watched by as many as 15,000 people. Pretty large. Um, even by today's standards, that's a pretty large crowd, although there are obviously larger. Uh, but back then, especially, that would have been, you know, a very large, large audience. Um, now, sort of the historical development of Greek theater uh, sort of arose out of these choral performances, which, of course, after reading Aeschylus, you can see that the chorus plays a very large, you know, prominent role throughout throughout the play, and even sort of changes place during during the period, you know, during during the course of the different plays. The 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 chorus is originally the the sort of the the elder, you know, Greek Greek uh, statesmen. Then it's the slave girls in the second play. Then it's the Furies themselves in the third play. Um, and the chorus, you know, basically, you know, performs the role that we would normally think of as a chorus performing. They sing, they dance. Uh, but in this case, they also, you know, interact with the actors. Anyway, so as it originally uh, developed, um, originally you just had these kind of choral, choral, choral performances. There would be a chorus, singing and dancing. And essentially, that's it. And eventually, it started to emerge that, well, like, all right, let's have like an actor. Let's have some dialogue going on as well. And originally, we just have you would just have one actor basically interacting with with the chorus. Eventually, then you had multiple actors. Now, uh, uh, for Aeschylus, um, it looks like you only have really two actors at a time, sort of interacting with with the chorus. So even at this period of time, you know, the, the sort of the evolution of 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 the theater was was still going on. Now, but Aeschylus, and, I, and I'll I'll get into this more, you know. Played a very big role in that, though. I mean, like I said, Aeschylus is the earliest of the three great of the three um, Athenian playwrights, three great Athenian playwrights, um, and sort of you know helped sort of expand this a little bit. I mean, I mean, I mean, may have even been the first one to come up with the idea of having two actors or multiple actors basically interacting with the chorus. Uh, supposedly, you know, also played a role, a big role in um, scene scene. Uh, design, you know, designing the sets and scenery in, in which the play would would unfold against um, the costuming, things like that. Um, Eskos played a, a, a big role. Now, you know, because we, we are reading our translation of this from the ancient Greek, of course, it's hard to appreciate maybe some of the, you know, artistic contributions that Eskos made. But you have to keep in mind, right, not only is he writing all, all of the dialogue, he's composing the music. Um, He's like I already said, you know, you know, designing the sets and the costumes. He's acting in the play as well. Uh, plays back then basically had all male male cast, and it's believed that Aeschylus, who did perform in the play, would have played the role actually of Cly Clytemnestra, who's probably the most important character, right? I mean, arguably at least. I mean, I mean, certainly it, it uh, appears throughout most of the play. I mean, as as is the only character to really appear in all three plays. Even though in in the last play, she, you know, it's only her ghost, uh, but it is her, but it is her character, obviously. So, so Aeschylus, uh, it's, you know, again, believed at least would would, would have been playing that. Uh, so he's doing a lot of things. So I, you know, I think you know, even if he can't read in, in, in ancient Greek, I mean, I think he could still, or maybe even fully appreciate because you know things do get lost in translation stuff. You know, may, maybe appreciate the the sort of li linguistic advances which he made, which he is credited with 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 you know uh, you know expanding the language of, of Greek tragedy I think you can at least appreciate that that he's wearing many many different hats he's playing many many different roles in the creation and uh performance of of this play um and I'll, I'll have some more things to say about that but anyway so um here's another interesting thing about it, is that choral performances though had a dual character I already mentioned that you know Aeschylus was a playwright, but he was also a soldier, and and you see this sort of dual role being you know performed through many aspects of Athenian life. 
So they were, you know, not just a means of artistic expression, uh, but the sort of synchronized movements, you know, particularly of the chorus. Um, also, it's believed, you know, were used to help prepare men for military training. You know, what you think of, you know, marching around and marching in a formation and, and things like that. It's it's an odd thing to think about in today's terms, but that that these you know, plays and other maybe artistic um, modes of expression, as well as, of course, athletics. Of course, we we, we always think of the Greeks, you know, the uh, uh, Olympics and, and things like this, had sort of a dual role. They, they were both a means of cultural life, but they're also basically a way of training people for military life. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, you know, Aeschylus himself played that role as, as well. Uh, so, for example, in, in the strobe and anti-strobe and epode that you may see at certain points during the course of the play, well, those really refer to, those, those, those would be parts that would be sung by the chorus. Uh, but there's also an element of movement to it as, um, as well. So for, for the strobe, the, the chorus, and, and, and usually the chorus would sort of be divided in half. And so half the chorus would be delivering the, the strobe and sort of moving from right to left on the stage in, in a you know synchronized way. The anti-strobe would be delivered by the other half of the chorus who would then move in the opposite 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 direction. And then for the epode, which is sort of like the you know the culmination of the climax of the sequence, the whole chorus would sort of take center stage and, and sort of you know fa facing the, the, the audience, you know, deliver the lines that way. And again, they 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 would be sung as well. So you, you see some evidence of that sort of synchronized movements and things like that. Um, anyway, so the, the later day philosopher, the 19th century philosopher, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche would later speak of what he considered to be the, the genius of the ancient Greek culture, and that they were able to combine both the Apollonian and the Dionysian aspects within their culture. Now, what does this mean, basically? Apollo and Dionysus. Uh, does anyone know what those gods represent, symbolically? Yeah, uh, Desmaris. Yeah, if I remember correctly, um, Dionysus is probably more uh, into the decadence, uh, uh, abundance side of things. Uh, I think he's the god of wine, yeah. of uh, Bari, whereas Apollo is more the god of art, um, of self-realization, of... Uh, but well, there is always many aspects because uh, it's also, in a sense, like any uh, uh, Greek god, also this dimension of love, especially violent love with Daphne, that kind of things. So to sum it up, I would say that Dionysus is probably the more, how uh, shall uh, I put it, um, a more festive part of things, uh, whereas Apollo, uh, it to, to me more reflect like the the artist uh, in his like doing his own things and focusing about his art if I could say mm -hmm. so instead of partying in, in a sense yeah uh, yeah I mean Apollo generally represents order Dionysian yeah wine drinking partying chaos counterposed to Apollo's order um, yeah, Apollo is, is associated with cre cre creativity and art, like you said. Um, now, Nietzsche would sort of pick up on this, on, the, on this theme, you know, the sort of synthesis of order and chaos, uh, you know, control and lack of control, um, civilization and cruelty, for example. Uh, so, and, 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 and he, again, regards this as an achievement of the Greeks. They're able to sort of, you know, combine both. They're not just purely one or the other, or they don't repress one. They don't repress, for example, the, Di the Dionysian aspects of, of culture in, in, in favor of the Apollonian aspects of, of culture, which is kind of his critique of, you know, European culture at, the, at, the, at this period of time, which I'll get to in a moment. Anyway, here's just real quick. So this is, would have been somewhat of, a recreation of of what you know the stage would have looked like, and you know the audience around it. Um, obviously, there's only you know a partial view. Um, you know the 
audience seating would have extended pretty far back. People probably would have been sitting in in the in the hills, basically, you know, watching this around. So pretty, you know, extensive, you know, production here. Um, and again, you know, Esco's played a big role in sort of originating this, or sort of, you know, at least helping it evolve. Um, anyway, so here's a, here's a famous quote from Nietzsche on the Greeks, which I think sort of, you know, sums up this idea of the Apollonian and the Dionysian aspects of culture. Uh, he says, when one speaks of humanity, the notion lies at the bottom that humanity is that which separates and distinguishes man from nature. But such a distinction does not in reality exist. The natural qualities and the properly called human ones have grown up inseparably together. So the natural qualities then would be, again, associated with uh, Dionysus, sort of just acting in a spontaneous way, you know, whereas the human, the self-control, the ego, conscious versus unconsciousness would, would, would be another, you know, sort of pairing here um, is, is, of course, identified with Apollo. Um, anyway, man in his highest and noblest capacity is nature and bears in himself her awful twofold character. His abilities generally considered dreadful and, uh, and in, in human are perhaps indeed the fertile so soil out of which alone can grow forth all humanity in emotions, actions, and works. Now, this is something from uh, a short aphorism he wrote known as Homer's competition. I have the rest of it here. It was a little too long to put in a slide. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just this long paragraph here. Again, you can see this is the what I, I just read. Uh, but anyway, he goes on to say, thus the Greeks, the most humane men of ancient times, have in themselves a trait of cruelty, a tiger-like pleasure in destruction, a trait which in the grotesquely magnified image of the Hellene, of the Greek, in other words, in Alexander the Great is very plainly visible which however, in their whole history, as well as in their mythology, must terrify us who meet them with the emasculate idea of modern humanity. So what he's saying here, and I, I would imagine people have, have heard this have heard this before, but basically what Nietzsche is saying is that, you know, the Greeks were, yeah, they were cultured and civilized, but they were, you know, they were, they were tough. They were butch. <laughs> they were they would go out and fight and, and things like that. And us modern day people, oh, we're so soft and complacent and blah blah blah. Again, I, I mean, I mean, you know, particularly among I would say among the right wing, Nietzsche was kind of a conserv a conservative philosopher. Um, I guess you could say he was kind of an a a political philosopher, but 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 his views did generally tend to, you know, seem more sympathetic towards right wing views. I certainly had no great use for socialism and had you know misogynistic attitudes towards women and things like that um so I, I i would say this is you know a fairly common theme oh modern day societies made people too soft and blah 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 anyway Nietzsche is you know kind of kind of saying this here um when alexander has the feet of batis the brave defender of gaza bored through and binds the living body to his chariot in order to drag him about exposed to the scorn of his soldiers that is a sickening caricature of Achilles, who at night ill uses H Hector's corpse by a similar by a similar train. Of course, referring to the famous scene from the Iliad, where you know Achilles does this exact same thing to Hector, um, who's the defender of Troy. Uh, but even this trait has for us something offensive, something which inspires horror. It gives us a peep into the abysses of hatred, with the same sensation. Perhaps we stand before the bloody an insatiable self-laceration of two Greek parties, as, for example, in the Corsarian Revolution, uh, which is an event from the Peloponnesian War, uh, when the victor in a fight of the cities, according to the law of warfare, executes the whole male population, sells all the women and children into slavery. We see in the sanction of such a law that the Greek deemed it a positive a necessity to allow his hatred to break forth unimpeded. In such moments, the compressed and swollen feeling relieved itself. The tiger bounded forth. A voluptuous cruelty shone out of his fearful eye. Why had the Greek sculptor to represent again and again war and fights in innumerable repetitions, extended 
human bodies whose sinews are tightened through hatred or through the recklessness of triumph, fighters wounded and writhing with pain or the dying with the last rattle in their throat. Why did the whole Greek world exult in the fighting scenes of the Iliad? I am afraid we do not understand them enough in Greek fashion and that we should even shudder if for once we did understand them thus. And then he goes on, but I'm not gonna read, read the rest of that. Um, but again, I think pretty much sums up his views pretty well here in this sort of dual nature of Greek, of Greek culture, which again, you can see in the lives of Greek figures like Aeschylus, even Socrates apparently, you know, served, served some time in the army when he was younger. Um, like I said, in the dual nature of Greek theater, which is both a means of artistic expression, but also you know, basically a, a way of training people for military service, that warfare was never far from the minds of the Greeks. You know, that there was almost constantly at war, in a sense, or at least, you know, you know preparing for war. Um, and that was just the world that they lived in. Now, of course, you know, Nietzsche kind of celebrates it to a certain extent. I mean, I mean, he said, well, people might, you know, shudder at this. And, and I, I would imagine most m modern people do. The, you know, the tigerish lust to annihilate and things like that. Um, but I think, I, you know, I think he is correct. And, and, and people like to often, you know, focus on Greek culture as being, you know, the sort of height of civilization and culture. Uh, in many ways, a golden age, which m m many people would argue that, you know, we've never been able to return to. Uh, there may be some truth in that. I mean, I mean, certainly I don't think you can deny the cultural achievements, not just in theater, but in philosophy, as, 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 as we'll cover, in science and mathematics, Pythagoras and, and, and people like that. All those things are true. But of course, it's also equally true that they also, you know, were warlike people and could be very, you know, cruel. Yes, this Maris. Um, to what extent would you say that um, Nietzsche kind of engages in sort of orientalism? And uh, because when uh, I hear was telling about the combination of uh, the fascination for art and for violence in the Greek society, I kind of have the feeling that something exists in many, if not all, societies. So to what extent would you say that um, Nietzsche approach wasn't spot or, or that it was some sort of romanticizing or making some sort of orientalism? Yeah, I think that there is definitely that tendency to do that, not, not just with the Greeks, but with other, you know, cultures as well. Um, you know, you could say that about American culture, you could say that about Japan and China and Egypt, and, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, all these things are, are true. I mean, there, there's this dual nature that's always at, at play, always at work. Unfortunately, the tendency has been to, you know, usually focus on one or over the other, usually, you know, to focus on the so-called um, Apollonian aspects of culture and to repress the Dionysian. Re repress being used in sort of a double sense because, you know, again, we're also talking about sort of repressing sort of the unconscious, you know, side of, of the human psyche as well which he seems to acknowledge at some point, you know, Nietzsche kind of sort of over, overlaps with, with Freud a little bit. And, and, and Freud was a great um, admirer of Nietzsche's writing as well. So I think there, there's that. And, 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 and again, going back to Nietzsche's, you know, critique of modern day culture, modern day culture in, in his time being, you know, late 19th century European culture, that it had become a very repressive culture, even though Nietzsche was not British, you know, we often associate with this with um, with Victorian culture in England, which is you know a highly repressed culture and things like that. But you know, you, you just sort of you know peel peel back the surface of the consciousness and the ego and all these other you know things are going on. Some of them quite you know un un you know unpleasant things as well. And 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 maybe there there's that argument that 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 that's what happens when you repress things too thoroughly, right? When when you when you don't sort of allow these things to sort of come up to to the surface more. There's maybe that argument to be, you know, to be made as well. Um, okay. Um, so of Atreus's race, this is a quote, you know, from early on, spoken by the Watchman in um, 
Agamemnon. Uh, and I, it's, it's just an interesting reference. Um, I don't know exactly where this goes to, but Atreus refers to Agamemnon's father. Um, another uh, title on, you know, for, for, for the trilogies is, 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 the, is the House of Atreus. Uh, now, the descendants of Atreus are also known as House Atreides, uh, which, curiously enough, is also the name of the family in Frank Herbert's Dune series of sci-fi novels and movie um, adaptations. But, I mean, I don't know what to say about that. I don't real. I'm not very familiar with, with the Dune series. I know it's a very popular, you know, series of novels. Um, I don't know if anyone else is or cares to comment on that. Um, I don't know if it's anything other than just a coincidence or he just sort of, you know, picked up the name because he likes it. Yes, Desmaris? Well, I only read the first book a few years ago, but from what I remember, one of the main themes is really the corruption that being to power brings. Uh, this, this idea of during this young man, Paul Atreides, and for the first part of, like, the books is kind of you know rising to power and, it, and it's seen in a quite of positive fashion but i think that herbert was kind of trying to highlight kind of the risk of becoming the sort of provincial man and the fact that with times you can uh, that one shouldn't trust people in power too much and not utilize them i think that is something like that and also <clears throat> uh paul's father uh, I don't remember, Leto, his name was Le Leto. I think he's quite a, a central figure and quite a model for him. So this idea of um, his parents, that the relationship between Paul and his parents is pretty central in the book. So maybe there's something related to that. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, they are, you know, aristocratic family. I mean, I don't know if, if the Atreides family in the Dune novels are you know, anywhere near as dark <laughs> as the family here, because because as I'll get to in a moment, there there's some pretty you know un un unbelievable you know atrocities committed. You know, besides what we actually see unfold during the course of the play, um, I only saw I've I've only seen the David Lynch version of the movie. I know there's a new version of it out. Uh, I only saw it because you know I like David Lynch movies. So like I said, I'm not very familiar with the. Uh, Herbert series, but I know it, you know, I know it's a very, you know, popular series. Um, and, you know, I, I am a fan of science fiction overall. Um, but, I, you know, again, I mean, uh, there, there, there's probably something to that. I mean, there's probably something in the idea, yes, of, you know, mis mistrust of power, the, the perils and pitfalls of, of, of giving, you know, too, too much power to people who sort of rule in an unaccountable fashion, you know, through, through, through the institution of monarchy and things like that. Anyway, so the the curse of the house of Atreus is actually a very well established thing in in Greek um, mythology. Aeschylus did not make it up himself, and this sort of cycle of murder, incest, violence, cannibalism extends before Agamemnon as well. Uh, so, for example, Atreus, Agamemnon, well, sometimes referred to as his father, sometimes re referred to as his grandfather. But I'll go by the interpretation that where it's his father, um, Atreus himself murdered the sons of his twin brother, Thyestes, and fed them to him. Now these are his nephews too, by the way. Not that it would be any any less horrible to do that to anybody, but he he kills his own nephews, feeds them to his brother, after discovering that his brother had adult uh, had committed adultery with his wife Europa. Uh, now. Thyestes had another son, who we know from the play, uh, Aegisthus, uh, with his own daughter. Thyestes has a, a son with his daughter. Um, Aegisthus would later murder Atreus and assist him in murdering Ag Agamemnon as, as well. So the relationships between these characters are very deep and complicated. And they are, you know, there are references to them. There are references within the play of you know feeding you know children to to people and things like that um at one point Orestes is, is referred to as the the dark blossom of a bloody seed which is certainly true i mean i mean there's just this whole family history of just you know horror basically and 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 the curse basically ends with Orestes as well he he essentially 
resolves the curse or essentially, you know, breaks the curse on his family that had been established for several generations. Now, prior to Atreus, well, let's see, Atreus' uh, grandfather is Tantalus, who is another important figure in Greek mythology. And I believe, yeah, here's, here's sort of an artistic representation of Tantalus, who was condemned by, by the gods to, as you can see here, be submerged in water with an apple or fruit, basically just out of his reach. When, when you hear the word tantalizing, for example, it's, it's sort of a reference to this. Now, what did Tantalus do to end up in, in such a horrible state? Well, he kind of did the same thing. Tantalus also killed his own son, Pelops, and attempted to feed him <laughs> to the Greek gods. What is it with this, this weird cannibalistic theme? I mean, there's at least two members of the family that are, you know, engaging in, in things like this. Anyway, the gods found it out. They were none too pleased, as you might expect. And this is essentially what happened to uh, Tantalus. Tantalus is a son of Zeus also, by the way. And, 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 and usually these sort of quasi-mythological kings, or at least their family lineages, are usually traced to divine origins as well. Almost, almost everyone is, you know, uh, you know, a descendant of Zeus within... Uh, Greek mythology. But anyway, so that's what happened to Tantalus. Now they they resurrected Pelops, his son, even though he killed and cut up into, into pieces, they brought him back to life. And then Pelops uh, had Atreus, who was his son. And, but you know, Atreus then, like I said, does the same thing. So it's 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 a very dark, dark story. Um now, you know, I, I probably won't make that many direct references to the text. Um I, I have a couple of things to say about the translation of the, the text. One thing I, I did do, you know, if you go, you know, if you do command F, if you have a Mac, like I do, or control F, you can search for, you know, words throughout, throughout, throughout the text. If, if you search the word blood throughout the Oresti, I think it's mentioned like 121 times throughout the, the, throughout the entire play. So there's a lot of reference to blood and then, you know, and, and to, you know, just these very like dark, dark themes that come out. Uh, throughout the entirety of, of the text. All right, so anyway, so when we get to, to, to the major theme of the text, obviously the major theme is justice. Um, now, interestingly enough, in all of the discussions I've read so far and all of the you know, um, responses that people have, have given to, to, to the question I posed last class, uh, pretty much everyone thinks that Ag Agamemnon's murder is justified, that yes, he deserved to die, basically. Uh, which is an interesting concept. I mean, I think that kind of contradicts the theme of the play, which is that, no, these things should not be done. You know, the, the culmination, the climax of everything is that, you know, you renounce blood feuds, you renounce vendettas, you renounce the idea of justice based on revenge and essentially transfer that power, transfer justice over to the state. And so the state becomes, the political authority becomes the sort of means of administering justice throughout society. So from that point of view, it, it would not be a justifiable thing to do. I mean, it would be something that would be handled by the state. If somebody commits murder, you don't go out and kill them yourself. You, you know, go through the government, you go through the authority, you go through the legal system. I mean, I mean, that's kind of the the main theme here. But there's a lot to be said about it, you know. For that, I mean, I mean, I mean, some people acknowledge that yes, from a certain conception of justice, it's justifiable, and yeah, you could make that argument. It, there is a idea of justice, perhaps that, that 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 allows for that to take place, but that ultimately is not, you know, the idea of justice that Aeschylus has, or or the idea of justice that he's trying to get across. Um, anyway, I mean, I mean, if you continue along with that thread, well, if Agamemnon's murder is justified, then is Orestes justified in murdering his mother? Apparently he would be, according to that. And it'd be interesting to, to consider, you know, would Orestes himself, uh, if you were in the jury trying Orestes, would you find him guilty or not? Maybe at the end of the class, I'll, I'll, I'll pose that to the, to the class. You can, you can write in the chat, you know, if you think he would be guilty or not guilty. Now, I don't want to, 
influence people to think either way. I, I don't r- really care what 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 people think about it. But I mean, I think it's quite obvious he's guilty of murder, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I could really argue that he's not. But you know, different interpretations, I suppose. Um. Anyway, so yeah, so so the idea of blood feuds, a vendetta is sort of resolved into or transitions into the idea of an institutionalized trial by jury rather than just this sort of, you know, people taking matters into their own hands, you create a legal institution which essentially takes over this role, so sort of takes over this function basically of providing justice. Um, but, you know, justice still needs a little bit of edge to it, right? I mean, I mean, justice is often symbolized by a sword and there's a reason for that. Um, and again, you know, at the end of the, you know, I'm uh, assuming, of course, that that everyone has read this, so I'll I'll be jumping, you know, around a lot. But um, at the end of the play, you know, Athena does not get rid of the Furies, right? She preserves them, and she says, "No, you still kind of have a role to play. We're, we're going to create this cult. People are going to remember you. People are going to honor you." And I think, you know, symbolically speaking, at least, this is the the idea that yeah, you know, justice by itself st- still needs force behind it, right? The Furies are sort of this, you know, embodiment of, you know, you know, vengeance, literally like a, you know, a spirit of vengeance, basically. And they're, and they're, you know, described as quite, you know, you know, horrible looking, you know, dripping with blood and things like that. So you need that, you need that sort of edge, you need that sort of coerciveness to make justice real. Otherwise, it's just, you know, it lacks any kind of real force to it. Um, and so the idea of justice in the play you know, requires many things. I mean, I mean, it's not just simply, well, we're going to, you know, now have a trial instead of just, you know, killing people ourselves. You know, it, 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 it reimagines the, the relations between the human and the divine, which, of course, gods play a very direct role throughout, throughout the play. Apollo, Athena, the Furies themselves can kind of be considered goddesses as well, though even older than the Greek pantheon of gods. Um, of course, what sets this all into motion is, you know, um, um, Agamemnon basically sacrificing his, his his daughter in a kind of ritual human human sacrifice basically to fight the war. Uh, I, you know, and Agamemnon is reluctant to do so. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to kill his daughter, but he believes that it's the only way, basically. So that that's another theme that that that, that you see also in in a, a lot of Greek uh, tragedy, right? The sort of dual conflicting loyalties to family, to the state, for example, in um, Antigone. That's sort of like, you know, the major theme of that play by uh, Sophocles. Uh, to, who, to who do you owe your greater loyalty to? To your family or to your country? And I think it's it's something that probably people still probably r- wrestle with even, even now. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, humans and divine, the social economic order, family life, male female relationships, all these things sort of come up for question basically in sort of refashioning or reimagining you know the concept of of justice. Now justice is a central concept in liberal political philosophy. I mean it's essentially why we're talking about it. Um, but there are other takes on it, right? And 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 I think one of the more interesting takes is the Marxist interpretation of the idea of of justice. So Marxists generally regard it not so much the idea of justice as false, but as not relevant and tend to operate in a different frame of reference, meaning that there are other questions besides simply justice and how we understand the meaning of uh, how we understand the meaning of justice and how it sort of you know takes shape within society, which means broadly speaking, you know, people get what they deserve, right? Justice means that you receive the treatment that you deserve to receive, essentially. Um, But is justice always the same thing? You know, there is a tendency, especially when you relate it back to the ancient Greeks like this, to to assume that justice is this kind of transcendent concept that sort of exists, you know, in this sort of abstract realm of the mind, which is incidentally very close to, you know, Plato's philosophy, which which we'll cover next class. But is justice really like that? Is, is, is justice something that sort of exists apart from society or sort of exists above society? Or is it something that is sort of material grounded 
materially grounded within the society that it emerges from, which is which is to say that justice changes basically what 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 would what would be considered just in one society may not be considered just in another. And I think that may be, you know, that might be an interesting question to try to, you know, pursue a little a little bit further. But there are other things to it. Justice, like I already said, you know, presumes that there is a state to enforce to enforce justice. That without state power behind it, the justice doesn't mean anything. But what if there's no state? You know, again, if if, if you're reading this from a Marxist point of view, um, you're not supposed to have a state in a socialist in a socialist society. The state is supposed to wither away in in in, in the famous phrase of Friedrich Engels. So there's that question, you know, can you have justice uh, without power to back it up? Or is it even a necessary thing? I mean, I mean, do you even, you know, if you don't have a state, do you even need the concept of justice? Um, and, and, and again, this idea of people getting what they deserve often rests on questions of the, distribu the distribution of resources within a, within, a, within a society, what is often known as distributive justice. How do you allocate the resources of society in a fair and equitable way? Well, and I'll talk about that in a, a moment, but again, Marx's famous response to this in a developed socialist society is that there would be no need for a fair allocation of resources, that there'd be an abundance of things in his famous phrase, from each according to ability to each according to need, which he says in the critique of the of the of the Gotha program, one of his later writings, that in a socialist society, you know, you wouldn't need to, you know, sort of ration things out in this way, where there would be a there would be no need to allocate things because everyone would have, you know, what they need, you know, more more than enough of what they need. Let me try to explain this a little bit more. So, um, I, I do have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, you were talking about uh, the, the Marx and Engels theories. Um, are you conflating uh, on purpose socialism and communism? Because Marx, well, okay. That's another question, but there is dispute over to what extent that distinction exists within Marx's, Marx's, Marx's writing. So I'm, I'm of the opinion that Marx didn't really see much of a difference between socialism and communism. What, 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 what he did is, is, is he spoke of a lower stage of socialism and a higher stage. And in the lower stage of socialism, there is a need to develop the productivity of society more. So at that point, at that lower stage, you have commodities being produced. There is a need to ration things out. But when you pass from the higher stage, um, Productivity is developed to, 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 to the point that you don't need to do that. You don't need to ration things out anymore and things like that. And it's referring to the higher stage where, where, where the phrase, you know, from each according to ability to each according to need um, applies to. It's in Lenin that you have this distinction that socialism is the lower stage and communism is the higher stage. I mean, that's one reading of it. Again, I think there's another reading where Marx did not make that distinction that there's a lower that, that that he tend to use the term socialism communism inter inter interchangeably in fact and that there's simply a lower stage of socialism slash communism and a higher stage um but yeah the the term that i just read basically you know refers to the higher stage but yes that is all premised on the development of productivity to how much you can you know it sort of enhance society's ability to to produce things to the point basically where there's no longer need to allocate things. There are other aspects to it as well. I mean, I mean, the so-called transition to socialism is then sort of another stage, uh, which again, Lenin tends to conflate that, you know, the, the, the stage of the so-called uh, dictatorship of the dictatorship of the proletariat um, Marx tends to assume that that happens before socialism. There's sort of a transitional stage from capitalism to socialism, <laughs> where you then get into the lower stage of socialism, where Lenin tends to conflate all of these things. 
it's a bit, you know, it's a bit confusing, but I mean, there, it, 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 it sort of stems, I think, from different interpretations of that idea. But anyway, I mean, at the very least, you know, skip, skipping over most of that, um, the idea, again, uh, from each according to ability to each according to, to need refers to, yes, when you've reached a highly developed socialist society, that there would no longer be a need for distributive justice. Now, the idea. Now, again, now the idea of justice within Marx, as I was about to turn to, um, is very much a debatable idea. So I think I already showed you, but I, I, I included a uh, su 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 supplemental link to another uh, essay, which you can read if you want. It's not required. Um, by Norman Garris, and he sort of takes up this idea that there are sort of you know conflicting interpretations of Marx's you know of 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 Marx on the idea of uh, on the idea of justice and 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 to what extent the idea or the concept of justice figures into Marx's theory. Essentially, there are two different you know interpretations of it. One says that you know Marx had very little need or use for the concept of for the concept of justice. There are many things that Marx says which tends to support that idea. I think even Re, re, refers to as you know verbal rubbish <laughs> at one point in one of his letters, uh, but then there are those interpretations which say that no, I mean justice is important. I, I mean it's how Marx is able to you know critique capitalism. The capitalism is a fundamentally un, 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 unjust system, and that if Marx is critical of the idea of justice, that he's critical of the sort of bourgeois concept of justice. So again, it's another confusing issue um you know garris takes up both both interpretations he he seems to come out on favor of the side that no in, in fact marx does you know there is a concept of justice which operates within within marx um I, I tend to think that's probably true i mean again it is very hard to critique capitalism otherwise there are various various points where marx says that you know capitalism is theft that 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 the, that the capitalists are essentially stealing from the workers um, by not, you know, paying them, you know, the full value of, of, of what they create through, through, through their labor and, and things like that. Um, and that in many ways, what Marx is doing is trying to sort of, you know, unveil or sort of expose sort of the hidden aspect of capitalism, where this goes on, where, which, you know, on the surface of things, it's not very obvious, maybe, that or it may you know on on the surface appear that you know capitalism is a just system that it's a fair system that people get what they deserve and blah blah blah, but he's saying that when you sort of sort of um, expose some of the hidden mechanisms at play that you realize that in fact it is not a just system, at least that's one interpretation of of, of the argument that could you know that could be made, um, which I think kind of makes sense, at least from that point of view. Uh, I was trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about that. Well, all right. So some people have often, you know, compared Marx to Freud, and in, in 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 just that Freud sort of, you know, unearths the sort of hidden layer of the consciousness, the un the unconscious part of the mind. The, some people have compared Marx to doing sort of the same thing that he sort of exposes the, the sort of unconscious side of capitalism or the dark side of capitalism, you know, for lack of you know for lack of for lack of a better term. And Marx, of course, does speak quite eloquently about the achievements of capitalism. I mean, if you ever read the Communist Manifesto, I mean, he goes on at length talking about all the great things, basically, that the bourgeoisie and the capitalists have done. But unlike defenders of the capitalist system, he, he would also say that, one, you know, these great achievements are possible only through great human suffering and sacrifice. So there is a kind of a dark side to capitalism, if you will. And the other is that, you know, as the system goes on, it starts to break down. You know, as as it as it develops more and more, it starts to run into these sort of internal contradictions, um, and and it doesn't perform as well, basically, over a long period of time, as as it does sort of in its initial phase. Anyway, I mean that's very much, you know, going in depth into, you know, Marx's theory, uh, which we can talk about. Um, I don't know if I'm you know belaboring the point too much here. I don't want to get too too off topic either. But suffice to say, I think what, what, what stands out here and what is interesting about this is that there is, what is implicitly being made is that, uh, that there is a kind of materialist argument being made for 
justice. That again, justice is not just this sort of transcendent concept that sort of floats above things or you know, sort of exists in this abstract realm of, of thought, but that justice is always sort of grounded in the material conditions of the society from which it emerges in. As it says here, standards of justice are relative or internal to specific historical modes of, of production. That's actually a quote from Garris, not, not from Marx. Um, and the mode of production for Athenian society was slavery. I mean, I, you know, it was a slave-based economy. Most labor was performed by slaves. Not all, but a lot of it was. Uh, which, of course, is different from a capitalist mode where, you know, workers are paid a, a wage. Although Marx would argue that they're, you know, are not paid the full value uh, for, their, for their labor. And, the, and that that gap between what they receive as a wage and what they create through labor is what he calls surplus value. And that surplus basically becomes the basis for um, profits in a capitalist system. And it's in, in that regard that he says that, you know, capitalism is basically a form, a form of theft, that the, the capitalists are essentially stealing from the workers. That's his argument, at least. Uh, but anyway, well, you know, I, I think, you know, where you fall down on that issue um, is not, is, you know, beside the point to a certain extent. Um, I think, you know, rather, again, I, I think at least holding to a, uh, let me just let someone in here. Um, a, sorry, I just saw someone pop up and then they went away. Maybe they left. Well, anyway, um, um, that, that, that on the understanding that justice does not, you know, just sort of exist, like I said, in a tran tran transcendent way, but it's sort of grounded in the society in which it comes from. So what it means, you know, simply put is that, you know, from the perspective of, Athenian society, things which are considered just, uh, we might not agree with the justice of, of those things. For example, of course, you know, Athenian society, like I just said, you know, permitted slavery. To be a slave was a justifiable thing, according to them. Or that some people, you know, again, if, if justice means getting what you deserve, then some people deserve to be slaves. Well, nobody would say would say that, say that today. But from their point of view, that was you know perfectly fine. That was perfectly in accordance with their concept with their concept of justice. Um, the disenfranchisement of women, of course, another important aspect, right? I mean, women did not vote or or, or have political power within Athenian society, and of course, for a very long time within Amer American society as as well. So those things are in accordance or sort of you know in harmony with their notion of justice but certainly would not we would not agree with that as being a just thing just like again you you could argue that you know from the perspective of a modern day you know bourgeois or capitalist or capitalist society that economic inequality among people is um a a justifiable thing some people have a lot of wealth and some people have none but to them that's okay maybe you want to make some minor tweaks here here and there but you're not you're not maybe you know asking for the kind of revolutionary changes that Marx is asking for, of course. Yeah, Jake. So would the they sort of view uh, the American prison system as exemplary if they're you know because we do have uh, forced labor and underpaid labor? Would they say that that is sort of a form of justice? Uh, what the Greeks, you mean? Yes. Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess they would be okay with it. I mean, um, they would probably say, why not just make them slaves? You know, <laughs> why even bother with, uh, you know, charging them with a crime and things like that? I mean, most, most slaves in ancient cultures were usually, you know, losers in war, basically. You know, you would fight a war, whether it was another city state or something like that, or a, a tribe or, or something like that. And if you lost, you know, you basically became, you know, the slaves of 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 the victor so that's kind of how it how it worked back then for the most part um so you know they would probably say that people place too much emphasis on wealth you know i mean i mean and not enough emphasis on virtue i'm, I'm trying you know it's an interesting question you know how would the athenians look at present present day society 
I would imagine maybe something like that. Um, I don't think there would be a significant disagreement. I mean, I mean, again, I mean, many people, you know, part of the reason why we're talking about this is because, you know, I, I would say for, for many people from a more sort of, you know, liberal mainstream sort of background, you know, they don't see a significant divergence between the Greek concept of justice and our own. That there is a kind of continuity of thought which exists. Obviously, yes, things like slavery, the disenfranchisement of women and things like that. But otherwise, I think I think a lot of people would say that there is a sort of, you know, a, a strong continuity, maybe not exact, but 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 some kind of continuity, at least between, you know, ancient cultures and, and our own. And I would just say that from a more materialist way of looking at things that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that I mean, I mean, these societies are radically different. And 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 I don't think there's that much of a continuity or or at least that that the you know, saying that it is, it is justice and not just sort of the ideology which tends to legitimize a certain form of rule, basically. I, I would say that's probably more to the point, right? That the concept of justice is meant to, you know, say that the Greek way of doing things is okay. And, and just like, you know, saying that the current, you know, inequality that exists within capitalism is more or less okay, that you shouldn't question it, basically. That you should just accept it as the way it is, in short. Uh, so here's a quote from Marx where he says, uh, do not the bourgeois assert that the present day distribution is fair? Uh, and, and is it not, in fact, the only fair distribution on the basis of the present day mode of production? Are economic relations regulated by legal conceptions or do not, on the contrary, legal relations arise from economic ones. Have not also the socialist sectarians, the most varied notions about fair distribution. So here again, Marx seems to be somewhat belittling the idea of fairness, justice, and things like that. Um, and he goes on to talk about the idea of wage labor. So he says, to clamor for equal or even equitable retribution on the basis of the wages system is the same as to clamor for freedom on the basis of the slavery system. What you think just or equitable is out of the question. The, the, the question is what is necessary and unavoidable with a given system of production. Uh, he says, again, instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, they ought to inscribe on their banner, they being you know, the workers, um, the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wages system. So that kind of gives you a sense of how, you know, revolutionary Marx was, you know, a, a word just gets over, overused a lot, revolution, revolutionary, but here he really means it, you know, and, and, and I think it is a good way of sort of illustrating the difference between what Marx is talking about and what, you know, frankly, passes for a lot of, you know, left wing discourse today. It's not about raising the minimum wage. Marx wants to get rid of wages. <laughs> you know, he doesn't think people should be paid a wage in exchange for their labor. It should just be kind of, like I said, a, a, or at least, you know, culminate in a, in a kind of free access economy where people work, but people also basically get what they want, not based on their ability to pay for things, which, you know, I would imagine most people probably did not agree with that idea, but it, it is at least, you could say, truly a revolutionary idea, one, one that actually, you know, earns, earns the title. Um, now, Marx, now here's where some of the confusion lies, is that Marx at different points suggests that wage labor is just, that, that when you think of labor or labor power, as he tend, tended to call it, the labor that the worker actually does as a commodity that is exchanged for a wage, that it is just. Marx actually, you know, when, when you look at it in, in those terms, as a commodity, which I think is an important qualification here. If you look at the labor as a commodity and they are selling their labor basically in exchange for a, a wage, from that point of view, it's a just transaction. It's exchanging one commodity for another basically. But the problem from that, for that though, is that should the worker be treated as a commodity? And of course, I, I think you could argue from a humanist or what some people call a trans historical historical perspective, a term I don't necessarily like because again, that's sort of getting back to this idea of a transcendent idea. But from a more sort of humanistic idea, no, of course, the 
the worker is not a commodity. The worker is not, you know, an object. It's a human being. So what they should not be treated as a commodity. So I think you you can make that argument. And again, I, I don't think it requires even really a standard of justice outside of society. I think from within the culture itself, yes, of course, we, we I mean, where does the idea come from that you should treat people, you know, like ends to themselves as, 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 as the philosopher Kant said, you know, not as a means to an end. I mean, that is a product of the same culture. So, so I think Marx is actually using the culture that he comes from, so-called, you know, for lack of a better term, Western culture, another problematic term, um, but using the standards of that culture to critique capitalism. But in a way, by he's sort of you know exposing aspects of the capitalist system that that are kind of normally hidden from people's view or from people's understanding of things. Um, all right, so one more you know note on this before I move on, and feel free to stop me at any point you know if if, if you want to interject something. All right, I see some more people coming in. Uh, let me admit them before they go away. Yes, this Maris. Um, so if I understand the red thread of this class um, is it's that justice as um, a political aspect of society cannot be distinguished from the distribution of resources. My question is uh, in the play, justice is seen to the prism of a murder, which is not necessarily something which is related to resources and distribution. So my question is how the question, how does the question of uh, distribution uh, is dealt with in the play? Well, it's a good question. I mean, there's indications, and, and again, it's sort of, you know, hinted at that, you know, um, Climanestra and Augustus are tyrannical rulers. So they're, you know, they're, when they, they, you would then presume that they're doing the things the tyrants usually do they're they're hoarding all the wealth for for themselves they're they're stealing from the public treasury and things like that um it's a good you know it's a good question i don't think the the notion of of distributive justice is necessarily at the forefront of the idea but almost inevitably any discussion about the concept of justice will inevitably lead this way i mean i mean it just always goes this way because you know, I mean, I mean, outside of the single application of this idea to a specific circumstance, you know, how do you then sort of extrapolate this idea, or how do you then sort of apply this concept to other circumstances? Um, so I think the distributive aspects of it, you know, necessarily follow from from basically any you know conversation about justice. Um, like many things in the play, you know, there, there are things that sort of like hinted at or that happen within the background, but you're right. I mean, I mean, I mean, the major focus, of course, is on the murder. But, you know, like I said, the tyrannical aspects of the usurpers, you know, the people who sort of, you know, take power away from Ag Agamemnon. I mean, it is pointed out that, you know, Agamemnon, for all, for all his flaws, was a good ruler. These people, they, you know, they're, they're horrible. And again, given the behavior of tyrants throughout history, we can generally assume that they're probably, in, you know, engaging in things like that, you know, stealing, hoarding things, you know, um, all sorts of corruption and, and things like that. Um, now, anyway, so, and like I said, this will be the last thing I say about it before moving on to another topic. But um, again, a theory of the distribution of resources and and I I, sh I should also say that you know this does also foreshadow to some extent what you know Plato and especially Aristotle talk about with this concept of justice does 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 loom large in their um, thinking, uh, but this idea of how you you know allocate the resources of society is you know premised on the idea of scarcity right that there that there's you know not enough things to go around for everybody. So you have to allocate things in a way that's fair. You have to make sure that the people who are most deserving of things get what they deserve again. Um, now, but there's an interesting question. This usually, again, often comes up in socialist arguments. To what extent is scarcity something that's sort of artificially created created today? That 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 sort of and you know in 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 you know to contrast that with sort of 
natural scarcity, you know, a, a real point in time where it's hard to produce food and hard to produce the material resources that you need in life, that everyone realizes, you know, again, especially preceding the capitalist era, that that was a real thing. But how much the scarcity really, you know, if I could use that term, natural scarcity still exists within a capitalist, particularly a, a developed capitalist society, and to what extent is scarcity sort of artificially imposed upon people? So, you know, basically keep them working. So just a few examples, right? I mean, uh, according to feedingamerica.org, uh, uh, 119 billion pounds of food is wasted every year in the United States. That's $408 billion worth, or basically 40% of the food supply is wasted. I mean, that's an extraordinary amount. Yet we have, you know, hungry people, yet we have people that are, you know, don't have proper access to good nutrition and things like that. Why is that the case? It's not because we can't produce enough food. It's because we can't get food into the hands of people that need it the most. And of course, it's because, you know, there's the money you know, because food is treated as a commodity. Um, many American factories operate at a reduced capacity, steel mills and things like that, you know, operate 50%. 25% capacity. Uh, other examples too, of course, you know, they, they could be producing much more. Uh, but the issue, of course, is not, you know, the need for these things, but, you know, being able to sell these things for profit on the market. So we actually significantly reduce, you know, what we're capable of producing within society. Uh, another example, you know, and I'm, I'm just passing over these quickly, but I think they're all true and, and still, you know, very relevant in, the, in, the, in, the, in that they deal with, you know, basic, basic needs. Landlords in New York City and elsewhere throughout other parts of the country, of course, are warehousing their apartments, their rental units, because uh, they want to get higher, higher rents, right? They're, they're not happy that they have to pay a subsidized rent or, you know, pay a, a, or, 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 or rent out their apartment at a, at a you know, a, a controlled rate, rent, rent control and things like that. And so rather than rent them out for a lower rent, they are basically just taking them off the market, like I said, and, and the term usually used for this is uh, where, where, warehousing them. Um, now in New York City, you know, I, in, well, in New York City, I think there's about, you know, uh, according to a report I read, about 15,000 um, rental units, which mostly includes, you know, apartments, but could include, you know, houses as, as well, which are being, you know, warehoused. Uh, there's about 100,000 homeless people within New York City. There's about, I think, half a million homeless people uh, throughout the United States. And that's probably a conservative number as well. So again, and, and all, all, all the time you hear about people talking about a housing shortage and the high price of housing and things like that. Well, again, it's, it's, it's not because there's actually a lack of housing. There's not a lack of supply. There's plenty, you know, there's a supply of housing and we could, you know, easily create more. But this is what happens with a capitalist system is that the the imperative to make a profit starts to conflict with the productive aspects of it. That you could produce more, but it, 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 it gets harder and harder to make a profit on what you're producing. And so the incentive then becomes to reduce production in order to preserve profits. And even then it gets, it st still gets harder anyway. So that would be, you know, what, 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 what Marxist theorists consider to be the core kind of or at least one, one of the core contradictions within a capitalist system, that production and profitability come into conflict with, with each other. And at a certain point, it gets harder and harder to produce more and, and still maintain a profit rate at the same time. Anyway, like I said, I don't want to get too, too far off of things, but you know, I think, I think the, the idea of the, you know, these sort of different you know, uh, interpretations of, 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 of Marx on the idea of of justice is worth reading, you know. If if you have time, maybe read it. Um, at least read, you know, the different interpretation. You know, the first two sections sort of cover the different interpretations of Marx. Marx for for justice. Marx against against uh, against justice. Before uh, Garris gets his own argument in there, which again I think he does pretty much come out on the on the idea that yes, justice does matter in in a Marxist uh, critique critique of capitalism. <clears throat> anyway, so another thing that, that stands out within the play is this idea of the sort of like evolving notion of political order. So again, like I, I mentioned a moment ago, Agamemnon takes place in a monarchy. The libation bearers takes place in a tyranny. Agamemnon has been murdered. 
Clymenestra, Aegisthus rule as tyrants. And that's, you know, referenced throughout, throughout the play or throughout that play at least. Um, and then it, in the humanities, although it's not explicitly stated, you know, it, it suggests quite strongly, I would say that, you know, the idea of living in a just society is impossible unless you are actually living in a democratic, in a democratic society. Uh, and this does tend to anticipate Aristotle's political philosophy, who has this kind of schematic of different political orders, monarchy, tyranny being sort of opposing forms and other, other, other uh, types of political regimes as well. Um, so the sort of evolution of a political order does seem to anticipate what, what Ar Aristotle will later say. Uh, it certainly, I think, you know, corresponds with the Athenians' own sense of their own, you know, political history, sort of emerging from monarchy, going through these different, you know, steps along the way, being ruled by tyrants at, at, at an earlier phase before sort of, you know, culminating in the democratic society that they were uh, so uh, proud of. Now, another interesting thing is that the Athenians tended to, and probably, you know, the Greeks in, in general, tended to associate tyranny with women. That, that, that a, a woman, whether it's perhaps, you know, talking about the mother or certainly talking about a female ruler, to them, there was a strong association between that and the idea of tyranny. And that is very much evident in the libation bearers. Clymenestra is the one in charge. I guess this may be the sort of figurehead, the one sort of, you know, on, on the throne, so to speak. But there's no doubt in anybody's mind that Clymenestra is the real, you know, power behind, behind the throne. And she's a, tyr uh, a tyrant, or she's portrayed as, as that way. Um, and, and so that's an interesting, and that it suggests maybe a, a, a sort of more general attitude that the Athenians had that, you know, women could not be good rulers, that they'll be tyrannical, that they'll be, you know, they'll be, uh, they can't control their appetites, their, their you know, um, all, the, all, all the usual, you know, stereotypes that, that people, oh, that the women would be too emotional and blah, 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 and all that, all that stuff. So that's interesting. And that's another theme I'll try to delve into a little bit. I see we're getting later on in the class. Uh, so I'll try to move things along a little bit. But anyway, so the chorus complains of Agamemnon that, you know, his, his wars are, 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 are costing the people a lot, both in terms of money, both in terms of, you know, human lives. Uh, but they do see him as a legitimate authority, right? He, he is overall a good king, a just king. However, Monarchical rule, even a, a so-called good monarch like, Agam like Agamemnon, um, there are irresolvable contradictions, right, within this form of rule, in that monarchs, you know, almost always entangle their own, you know, personal affairs, private affairs with the affairs of the state. And that is sort of, you know, something that you can't really separate. You could have a good king, a just king, but no king will really be able to completely separate their own private affairs from the affairs of state. And the Trojan War is a good example of that, right? Does anyone know what leads to the Trojan War? I mean, how this whole conflict gets initiated in the first place? Yes. Uh, yes, this is Maris. Uh, if I remember correctly, so um, the royal family of Troy as different children and one of the sons goes to Greece Paris. and I think one Greek goddesses owes him a favor or something he promised to him the most beautiful women of Greece and he goes to Greece I think the the son question is called Priam not Priam uh, Paris. Priam is the king of Paris. Troy yeah, yeah Paris think, is, is his son yeah, Paris, and uh, I think the woman's name is uh, perhaps Ellen. Uh, Ellen, yeah. Yeah, and so they fight, I think they generally fight, fall in love, and he takes her to back to Trojan. But problem is Ellen is the wife, I think, or the fiance, I don't remember, of an uh, important Middle person life. in Greece. So this person can uh, ask for the help of all the Greek cities to go uh, to Troy and wage war in order to 
bring back Ellen back to, to Greece. Yeah. And so it begs the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Jacob. Yeah, um, from my understanding of the crime, a lot of this makes Agamemnon a, a, a massive hypocrite. Um, I haven't posted my, I, I haven't half written out my analysis of whether he should have been killed or not, but I actually, I've read a lot of them. I, mine is no, because he, like the, the crime, uh, he, he sacrifices his daughter to save the lives of many men, et cetera, et cetera. He could have, given that women are seen as a commodity, politics assumes that he could have asked for some sort of physical uh, uh, or uh, monetary, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, compensation. Compensation for the loss of the most beautiful woman in Greece or Rome or whatever. Um, it, yeah, that was sort of my like, uh, and, and I do know that the whole conflict was started just by a theft, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would say to that. I, I mean, the whole war basically starts because, yes, Paris comes to Greece, runs off with Menelaus's wife Helen, who's much younger than him. Agamemnon is Menelaus's brother. They're two kings. They start this big war, but the whole war basically starts because one guy stole another guy's wife. Well, who cares? <laughs> why should why should people have to go fight? And die because of this, because some rich guy stole another guy's wife. But yet the whole, you know, I, I mean, uh, again, going back to this idea of the contradiction of a monarchy is that, you know, everyday people get sort of swept up in these things. You, you, you get enlisted in these causes that often resolve around private squabbles, basically, between the ruling class. Yes, does Maris? Um, something I, I thought very interesting uh, in the play is that pretty much everybody's bitter because they feel that someone had the bright idea to wage a war in some countries 10 years ago and everyone's kind of you know mourning the loss of young men sent to war and I think that's an interesting well they, that's truly like parallels to be made with the situation of western countries in which this idea of was it legitimate was it a good idea to send people abroad. Uh, and I kind of see a resonance uh, in that aspect of the play. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, there, there, it, it does come up, you know, during, during the play, especially during, you know, the early part that, yeah, it's like, you know, what, what are we fighting for? You know, a, a question that you're right, people in the United States often ask too, right? Whether it's the Vietnam War or the Iraq War. Um, I, I mean, the Iraq war was fought over oil, I, I would say. But I mean, like, at, you know, at least it wasn't because, imagine if the war was being fought because, you know, Osama bin Laden stole George Bush's wife or something like that. And then like, you know, thousands of people have to have to go and fight, fight this war. I mean, it's crazy, but that's the kind of reality or, 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 or that is what people are subject to in, during that form, form of rule. Bush, for, for what it's worth, did at, at one point point out that, Saddam Hussein tried tried to kill his dad, so I guess you know even even there he's couldn't help but you know inject some you know personal element into it. Uh, did someone have their hand up or, or no? Went back down. Yeah, no. I I also wanted to say that uh, it was sort of <laughs> it's it's oh god I forgot what I wanted to say. Never mind. I think that's what I put my hand. Okay. Up. Well, if it comes back, you know, just uh, speak up. But um, so yeah, so again, so. Agamemnon, by all accounts, is a good ruler, but in any kind of monarchy where power is just placed in the hands of this one person and, and their family, I mean, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get this sort of entanglement between you know, public, public and private issues. Now, things get even worse when Clymenestra, or at least from you know, Aeschylus's po point of view, things get even worse when Clymenestra is ruling things. Now it's just a full-blown full tyranny. Which again, in Aristotle's view of things, is sort of the 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 opposing form to a monarchy. A tyranny is like a corrupted version of a monarchy, in other words. And she's even worse. You know, Ag Agamemnon was at least a just ruler. 
but she's, you know, according to, you know, at least what you hear from the chorus and stuff is that, you know, she's, you know, just, you know, horrible, basically. <laughs> and so, and again, it does eventually resolve itself, but, but what, what, what is working out here is, is what is often referred to as a dialectic. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with, with, with this term, but this is a concept in philosophy. And it is this idea that, yes, sort of things move through this kind of internal contradictions kind of work it working themselves out so in in this case we sort of see different sort of stages of development of political order sort of working themselves out to a higher form you would you would assume as they sort of deal with their internal contradictions or limitations i guess you could say but contradictions is is, is the preferred term so again like i said a monarchy has contradictions to it um it it it, it transitions again the term transition also important in, in a dialectical view of things. It transitions into its opposite form, it becomes a tyranny. It then transitions again into a final form, which is a democracy. Now, the idea is that during the transition, it, it, it sort of sort of builds upon what, what came before it, right? So a tyranny has traces of a monarchy in it, right? A, a tyranny is a corrupted version of a monarchy. Democracy is sort of builds on that as well. Now, what is different about that is that people have realized that, okay, when you have power concentrated in the hands of one ruler, it's generally not a good thing, whether it's a good king or a bad queen or whoever. Um, there seem to be too many problems, basically, with the idea of giving power to just one person. So what's the obvious solution to it? You give power to more than one people. You decentralize power. And that then supposedly takes place in, in the culmination, uh, which it, which is democracy. But again, you could, that process could then start up again. Then you could look at well, what are the contradictions within uh, democracy as 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 well? Some of them we've already talked about. Well, you have slaves. You have you know women don't have any political power. So this process is sort of working through these inner contradictions. You know, continues basically. Um, so language plays a big role in this as well. Justice is not just based on actions, but on language, right? You have to be able to persuade people and make arguments. The meanings of actions are seldom, if ever, self-evident and require interpretation. Someone kills somebody. Okay, well, what, what is the meaning of that? What is the significance of it? The meaning of it is not self, self-evident. You have to understand what, what's going on. All of the murderers in the play try to justify their actions, which you can, you know, accept or not accept, you know, depending on your point of view. Uh, Aeschylus's use of language is universally considered to be brilliant, but it is hard to appreciate, especially obviously since we're reading a translation of it. Um, more complex than prior theatrical works, it's filled with metaphors, imagery, and circumlocution, which means basically using a lot of words to describe something, which, you know, some people might not like, but that are generally considered to be one of the uh, attributes that, that Aeschylus introduces here. Uh, there are various problems, you know, with the idea of communication. In the libation bearers, I, Orestes comments that men can only speak openly to other men. The men and women can't communicate honestly with each other, he says. Um, Cassandra, one of the most interesting characters who only appears in the first play. Her prophecies are always true, but nobody believes her. So she's telling people what, what's going to happen, but no one's listening thus suggesting problems with language. You know, you, you know the difficulties basically um, in, in um, communicating with people. Um, this also suggests that the application of justice will always fall short because we, we, we don't have a, a sort of perfect, you know, God's eye view of things. Our understanding of people's actions will always rest upon how they're able to explain themselves. And, and that, of course, means that there will be flaws to it. Human justice, and again, I think this is symbolized by Athena towards the end, still requires a bit of divine intervention, so to speak. It's an image of Cassandra. Um, all right, so this will be the, sort of the last thing I hit on, the last theme I'll address, but I think it's interesting. So um, justice requires the political disenfranchisement of the female who is given a, the separate role in, in the cult or religious life. Women can play a role in religion, but not play a role in politics. Um, Apollo, and this is when he's defending 
Orestes, by the way, <laughs> which I don't think he does such a great job of it. Orestes even says that, uh, I'm sorry, Apollo even says that Orestes is, is not kin to his mother. His mother is not his actual relative. It's an odd argument, but only to his father. Again, suggesting that, you know, fathers and sons only have a relationship to, to each other. Mothers and sons don't, apparently, or at least according to Apollo. Uh, Athena is born from Zeus, according to mythology. Athena does not have a mother, but sprang supposedly from Zeus's forehead. Um, already, you know, uh, already uh, adult, basically, you know, it's bizarre, bizarre stories. But uh, anyway, um, wisdom, Athena embodies wisdom or symbolizes wisdom. Wisdom is child of pain and born with many a tear. Meaning, of course, that, you know, wisdom comes through struggle and trials and tribulations and, and things like that. Um, Athena says, I vouch myself the champion of the man, not of the woman. Yea, with all my soul. So she's on the side of the man, basically. Um, now, interestingly enough, now this idea that, that Orestes has no relationship to his mother is contradicted earlier in the play in the libation bearers, the bearers, uh, where, where the chorus says about Orestes, well, actually Orestes and Electra. And that's another thing. I haven't said anything about Electra. Electra shows up in the second play and then she just goes away. She, she plays no role at, at all in the third play. You know, she just is there for a little bit and then, and then she's gone. Um, but they say of their of their children, of Orestes and Electra, her children's soul is wolfish, born from born from hers and softens not by prayers. So this would at least contradict that view that no, Orestes does in fact inherit qualities from his mother, particularly his wolfish soul. He's like a wolf. He's, you know, vicious in other words. Um, from a, from a Zeitling, who's a, a classic scholar, considers the... Or, Orestia as affirming the myth that that women that that should say women that women once held power but right, rightly lost it for abusing power, thus affirming male social dominance. Um, now, in, in an interesting sort of echo to this, the graphic novel From Hell, which I don't know if as anyone has ever read or heard of, uh, which is about the Jack the Ripper murders in the late nineteenth century, but really about you know the class system in in. Victorian England, as well as, and again, patriarchy basically, also references this idea as as well. That long, long ago, you know, societies were matriarchal. And then patriarchy kind of came about and sort of usurped that 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 power. Women once were dominant, but then the men, the men came in basically and 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 overthrew, overthrew the women basically and asserted their dominance over them. And there's a chapter in the book which happens to be my favorite chapter in, in, in the book, uh, where the presumable Jack the Ripper murderer, who in this story is Dr. William Gull, a real person, a physician who is, you know, pegged to be the murderer in this. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any truth to that. I mean, this is historical fiction. I don't, I don't think they're trying to, uh, you know, say this is how, how the murders actually happened, but, but just using this as an occasion to tell the story. Uh, but there's an interesting part of the book where he goes through the city of London with his carriageman, his coachman, and sort of maps out the geography of London, sort of pointing out all these symbols of patriarchy, which I think is very interesting. Uh, the term for this apparently is, is known as psycho psychogeography, and sort of like you know exploring these sort of like hidden, you know, sort of cultural meanings that that they see in a, in, in a lot of uh, cities apparently. Uh, so Moore, Alan Moore, who wrote From Hell, references the, the book uh, Beyond Power by Ma Marilyn French, uh, which you maybe want to check out. So anyway, so some of the things that Gull points out, and of course, Gull, you know, the Jack the Ripper, the murderer, you know, killed five women. Uh, four, I think four of the five were prostitutes. Uh, possibly the fifth woman uh, was a case of mistaken identity or something like that. Um, and in this story, it's, it's being done as kind of like a ritual sacrifice, sort of like reassert the power of, of men over women, uh, which, which Gull feels in the late 19th century is coming apart. And he talks about things like socialism and changing gender relations and, 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 and things like this. And going back to the Apollonian and the Dionysian, he sees that this is, you know, like order is breaking down, basically. Working class people are demanding the vote and protesting and rebelling 
you know, again, women are, are, are starting to, you know, become independent of men from Gaul, who is both, you know, upper class and a man, obviously, you know, this is symbolic of, or sim symptomatic rather, of society breaking down. And, and he's trying to, you know, do, do what he can basically to uh, preserve, you know, the so-called natural order of things. Anyway, some of the things that he points out, which I think is very interesting. Um, he talks about Bodica or Boadicea, uh, the warrior queen of the Aseni who led an uprising against the Romans in 60 or 61 CE, which is now on Battle Bridge Street in London. These are all real locations within London. Uh, she was a real person, a female warrior queen uh, who, who, who led an uprising against the Romans, was successful at first, but you know, obviously things didn't work out well for her in, in, in the end. Interestingly enough, uh, Bodica is the Celtic equivalent of the name Victoria, which of course has a very important significance in English culture as well. Uh, they cross over Al Albion Drive, where the poet William Blake wrote Visions of the Daughters of Albion, uh, which starts off with Enslave the Daughters of Albion Weep, a Trembling Lamentation. Now, Blake, who saw visions and was considered a, a lunatic in his day, uh, more speaking through Gull, makes the case that, 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 you know, Blake was in touch with the right side of the brain, which he, again, uh, references in, in in association with Dionysus, who again symbolizes dreams, the unconscious. Apollo is the left side of the brain, the rational side, the controlled side, the ego versus the unconscious, so, so he says. Um, Apollo is the sun god. So sun is associated with the male principle, is associated with order, with rationality. The female side represents the opposite, even though Dionysus is often portrayed as, as a man. The goddess Artemis, for example, or Diana, is also goddess of the moon. So you see the, the, the conflation or the uh, contrast between the sun and the moon. Um, Atom, the Egyptian sun god, who's kind of like an analog. You know, I, I think everyone knows these pantheons all have their counterparts and analogs and things like that. So Atom, the Egyptian sun god, is also symbolized by the obelisk. The obelisk, which is a phallic symbol, is basically a shrine to the sun god. So think about that in re relation to what I just said, to, to um, the sun, to order, and to the male principle. It's a phallus. It literally is. Um, obelisk could would be found in the city of Heliopolis, which is modern day Cairo, the city of the sun. One of which, the which is called a, Cle a Cleopatra's needle, an obelisk was taken from Cairo, actually taken from um, Al Al Alexandria and taken to London, which is still there to to this day. There's another one in New York City in Central Park. Um, again, like I said, male, sun, order are symbols, just as female, moon, chaos are symbols. M London is filled with symbolic representations of the sun. So this, going back to what Zeitlin says about the Orestia being this sort of, you know, myth of affirming male social so, so, social dominance, you can see that, you know, throughout in, in other examples as, as well. For example, in the city of London, um, gods are just a symbolic representation, obviously a projection of her own essence. Uh, now, Blake, uh, apparently during one of his visions, says, uh, supposedly speaking to John John Calvin, the Protestant, uh, that is the Greek Apollo pointing to, to the sky. He is Satan. Uh, interesting enough, Blake is buried in the shadow of an obelisk. Here's actually a, a photograph of this. Uh, the obelisk is actually to uh, Dan Daniel, Daniel Defoe. Um, and Blake's gravestone is in the shadows. You can barely see it there. But, you know, interestingly enough that he would, you know, proclaim the sun god to be Satan. And he basically has to rest for eternity uh, next to a symbol of that. And again, the, 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 the idea of the phallic symbol of an obelisk being a sign of worship or, or being a sort of, uh, you know, like a, like, a, like a shrine, basically, to the sun god, I think is very interesting. Here is, again, the Cle Cleopatra's needle in London, another obelisk. Now he also talks about the architect, Nicholas Haw Hawksmore, an architect who built several quote-unquote Christian churches in the late 1600s, early 1700s. 
Hawksmoor is also often re referred to as the, the devil's architect. And even though he's designing Christian churches, his, his beliefs have snuck pagan designs into his churches. And is it, it, influenced by a group known as the Dionysiac Architects, who themselves were alleged to be the master craftsmen of the city of Atlantis. And were apparently an influence on the Freemasons, of, of, of which Hawksmoor was a member. Not likely a member, he was a member. Uh, now, the myth of Atlantis, another important Greek myth. Some say it's, it's real. Some say it's, it's, it's not. Um, some argue that Atlantis was actually the Greek island of Crete, which I mentioned earlier in class, this island to, you know, to, the, to the south of the Greek peninsula. Um, and it's believed perhaps that there was a major catastrophe. I mean, I mean the story of Atlantis is that Atlantis you know, sinks. So maybe Crete was hit by a tidal wave or something like that, was damaged. So all these Cretan architects... And craftsmen leave and, and, and go travel throughout the ancient world, building all these, apparently many of the so-called, you know, wonders of the ancient world are, are apparently attributed to these so-called Dionysiac architects. Uh, Cretans, Cretan designs influence Mycenaean culture. Again, Agamemnon is actually the, the king of Mycenae, not, not Argos. Uh, and there are Mycenaean symbols carved in Stonehenge, which is in England. Well, that's kind of far away from Greece, right? And, and what is Stonehenge? It's a solar shrine. It's another sort of monument to the sun. <laughs> so the idea of a Dionysian architect are a contradiction. Dionysus, again, represents partying and drinking and, and, and things like that. So it's a contradiction in terms. An architect isn't supposed to be like that. An architect is supposed to be controlled and sober and rational and, and things like that. But it's the idea, again, this, this sort of like what Nietzsche said, you know, sort of combining the Apollonian and the Dionysian together, uh, that they were, you know, and these are semi mythological figures anyway, that these are architects who were guided by the unconscious, that their design sort of flowed from the unconscious part of their mind. Um, and Atlantis itself, even if it's not a real thing, can be seen as a symbol of the, uh, a symbol of the unconscious, a city that's submerged underwater. Just like the unconscious part of our brain is, is, you know, submerged under the conscious part of it. So anyway, here's a few examples of Hawk, Hawks, Hawksmoor's churches that, that are sort of spread out throughout London. They're all obelisks. They're all, again, sort of shrines to the sun god, shrines to masculinity, basically. And again, very... Phallic look. I mean, I mean, I mean, the 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 phallic nature that makes it kind of obvious, right? The association between them and patriarchy, maleness, the male principle, masculinity. But they're also associated again with Apollo, the god of the sun in Greece, or or the other sun gods. And so you'll see this throughout. Now, now Christ Church. So this is Saint George's, and uh, you know, from left to right, on top Saint George's, Saint Luke, Saint Anne's. Christ Church is in. The east end of London, which is where the the, the Jack the Ripper murders took place, uh, a, a notorious slum, you know. So you have this very squalor, uh, squalid area, and then you have this, you know, imposing looking structure basically within the middle of it. Uh, Hawksmoor also helped build St Paul's Cathedral in London, uh, which is built on a shrine to the goddess. Artemis, so symbolic of that, you know, replacing female power and replacing it with male power, in other words. Um, all right, so that's an interesting I idea. Um, you know, this is, you know, so I've, I've sort of given a, a kind of Marxist and feminist reading of the Orestia, which I don't think are in conflict. I think they are sort of overlapping interpretations. Um, again, male um, authority is also identified with politics, whereas female authority is identified with religion, which takes a more sort of passive role. So there's that aspect of it as well. You know, from a Marxist point of view, again, you know, political authority is used to, you know, preserve the power of the bourgeoisie, preserve, you know, pre you know, preserve the power of the capitalist class. Uh, so there are these sort of overlapping aspects of it. Now, the last few things I'll say, and this is, all right, so I'm, I'm a liar. It's, quarter after two, so I've been talking for a while. I'm sorry for talking so long, but um, just a few things about the translation of the play. So uh, the meter of the play is, is, is different based on the translation. Now we read the translation by Morrishead. 
Meter is the basic rhythmic structure of a verse, of a verse in poetry. Uh, rhythm is often measured by the iams or feet or the step of a line. And in English poetry, uh, a foot is sort of given by the stressed and unstressed syllables. So one stressed and unstressed syllable makes up one foot, basically. Um, in English poetry, again, this often used patterns of unstressed and stressed syllables. In Greek, in Greek poetry, it's long and short syllables. So it's a, a little bit different. Uh, again, our translation follows Morishead, which is written in iambic pentameter, which is very characteristic of English poetry, kind of like almost like a, a, Shakes, a Shakespeareanized version of the Orestia. Iambic pentameter, again, means five feet. So here's, uh, and you know, the, the, the first line of the play from, from Moore's head. You know, I, I pray the gods to quit me of my toils. And you can see the, the pattern of stressed or un, unstressed and stressed. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. So if you read it in that kind of rhythm, hopefully maybe it's a little easier to read or at least kind of make sense with, with what, what is sort of go, going on there. But not all the translations follow that. Uh, others are written in hexameter, six feet per line. Like Rodney Morrill, I pray the gods to grant me respite from these toils. Same line, but different translation. Others, like Peter Meinick, are even more different. Gods, free me from these labors. All different versions of the first line of the play. But as you can see, depending on the translation, can be often be fairly, fairly different. Notable performances. Uh, I, I won't read this out. I mean, you, you can read it yourself. I did include the Peter Hall version, which you can find on YouTube. I also pr provided a link from it. Uh, this is a still image, obviously, from that. Uh, I mean, this is probably pretty close to how, how the play would have been performed with these masks. It's an all-male cast. Um, again, Aeschylus likely acted in, 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 in the play and is generally believed to have been Clytemnestra, who's arguably, again, the most important character. Uh, this scene here, this would be the Furies, and that's Apollo standing behind them. And again, Aeschylus apparently played a big role in, in you know, not, not just writing the play and the music and everything and acting, but, you know, coming up with these, you know, designs and costumes, although who, who knows how, how close they are to the original designs that they would have used. But something like this, again, with, with, with the masks and, and things like that. All right, so I think I pretty much covered everything that I wanted to say. Uh, now, real quick, for anyone who's still following along, um, what what do you think would have happened? I mean, if you were in the jury, we have 11 people here. If, if you were in the jury, how would you have uh, voted for Orestes? Why don't you write it in, in the chat? Guilty or not guilty? And we'll pretty much wrap things up here. Guilty. All right, I may have guilty, <laughs> guilty. We're, I mean, we're pretty close to an actual jury here, so probably guilty, 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 guilty. Yeah, I don't know, you know, how he could argue against it, but of course that's not what actually happens, right? He is in fact acquitted, so. Um, and and you know with a very dubious uh, defense on 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 the on the part of uh, Apollo. Anyway, so uh, that'll wrap things up here.